Okay, we're recording. Okay, sounds great. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brent Nickel. Um, I'm an ag conservation uh, practitioner here for the Nature Conservancy. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, started off my career uh, in Central Ohio um, in ag retail um, as a salesman. Um, during my couple years at that location, I was transitioned into uh, that kind of that precision ag guy. So I was doing some uh, dry fertilizer, variable rate recommendations, and a lot of their field mapping. <clears throat> um, and that took me to a, uh, a different role in uh, North Central Ohio as a precision ag specialist, um, really working with um, yield data, uh, dry fertilizer recommendations, uh, variable rate seeding recommendations, and uh, really diving into soil samples. Um, so I'll be covering obviously this return on investment across the acre portion. Um, this topic is very big. Um, so for the sake of time, um, it's going to be really dialed in uh, to um, cover mostly yield data. Um, and what I hope that we get out of this uh, for the audience um, as we kind of wrap up today, um, just to learn the importance of utilizing this yield data um, and utilizing all this information that comes off of the farm. So I'll just get started here. Let me see. There we go. Okay. So today we're going to cover storing farm data. Uh, this will include getting started with a platform, uh, properly utilizing it, um, and just in general, getting started with this data management portion. Uh, next, we're gonna cover what to do with all this data once it's properly imported and sorted through. Um, and then we're gonna cover how to build uh, this bigger picture um, when we start to utilize all this information. Uh, next, we'll take some of this information that is gathered and apply it in a practical way, and then go through an example um, of how to utilize all of this information um, and apply it to on-farm uh, management practices. Um, and at the very end, we can open it up to questions, um, either through the chat or if you'd like to come off mute. Um, and these first few slides will mainly cover how to build just a solid base of information. And I'm gonna run through them um, a little quicker than the back half of the presentation. Uh, but I think it's really important uh, to start to build this solid base so we can start to apply the data and make um, ROI decisions based off of it. <clears throat> so just getting started here, uh, Stephanie, if you want to open up that Zoom poll, um, just going to try to gauge where the audience is at on this data management um, and how familiar everyone is um, on working with some of these farm management pl platforms. Um, after these questions, kind of depending on what we see here, I'm going to offer up some recommended platforms that I've used uh, in the past uh, just to help those who aren't currently using one potentially get started with data management. Just give it maybe 30 more seconds here and uh, I'll get rolling. Yeah, Brent, you might just want to give it a few more seconds. A few people just entered. Okay, yeah, not a problem. Looks like we're currently using farm data management platform. That's good. And I'll let you open up question two, Stephanie. Actually, I'm sharing the results right now. I think we saw it, but they didn't. Okay, good deal. Okay, so uh, this next question, um, it's just going to ask uh, what platform we are using. Um, this will kind of give me an understanding um, of kind of where the audience is at um, and what they're using um, the platforms for. So, okay, I see someone answered SMS. So something a little bit more advanced. That's that's good to know. Awesome.
Okay. And let me know when I'm good to go and keep going, Stephanie. Okay, you're good to go. It looks okay. like we had the only two that were being used were SMS and climate. Okay, awesome. That's good to know. So I'll just kind of jump right in here then. Um, so just getting started with data management, um, what I would recommend the first thing to start doing is collect your data. Um, even if you don't have a platform decided on or not sure what to do with all of your information, um, at the very least, collect it. Um, and put it on a zip drive or something and store it. Uh, because once you make a pass in that field, whether it be planting or harvest or anything, and you don't log or store that information, um, it's gone and you can't utilize it. Um, next, decide on a software platform to use. Um, this, at least for me, uh, can be one of the more overwhelming parts of this data management piece, but um, each farm data platform has its pros and cons and there are so many out there and it can seem difficult to choose. Uh, but here in just a little bit, I'll show five that I've used in the past um, and can be really good starting points to start utilizing some of this gathered data if, um, if those of you out there aren't already doing so. Um, once you have your platform picked out, there we go, uh, create your field boundaries. Uh, for data to be logged and utilized, it must be tied to a field and its boundary. Um, every program I've worked with, uh, you can do this manually by just dropping points around the field edge, or you can upload, uh, if you're more, a little bit more tech savvy, you can upload shape files and have them all, if you have them already. Uh, next is to play around with the program and familiarize yourself with it. Uh, this part is probably one of the most important, uh, because if you have a program you aren't comfortable with or are hesitant of using, uh, then you most likely just won't use it or not get the most out of it. Um, and last, ask for help. Um, all of these platforms will either have a rep, um, a service provider, uh, an online tech, or uh, someone related to that to help you with anything related to a problem. Um, a lot of platforms also come free if you're a customer of a retailer that offers some sort of platform. Um, retailers are more than willing to help you uh, get set up uh, with that data management when it comes to their program. Um, also, it should be noted that for more advanced applications of data, such as you know, fertilizer prescriptions, variable rate seeding prescriptions, uh, trying to play around with any of this yield data utilization, um, there are uh, sometimes fees associated with that service. Uh, data management is some people's full-time job for a reason, um, as it can sometimes be time consuming, and uh, sometimes there is a fair amount of training involved. Um, so expect some sort of fee for more complicated applications of data um, and just be sure to ask for help. So I'll just jump right in. So if you're just getting started, there are a couple platforms that I like uh, just to help with getting started to applying your data. Um, and all of them are pretty user friendly. Um, the first one being JD Operations Center. So John Deere Operations Center. Um, when you decide to utilize this platform, uh, it can be linked up to gather harvest data automatically. automatically. Um, it then logs all of that data onto your account uh, for easy visualization. Um, a lot of other platforms will link up to JD Operations Center, um, and it can be integrated to pull over data automatically when uh, JD Ops gathers it. Um, that can be really helpful if you end up wanting to utilize um, a more beefed up program uh, to do more advanced things with this data, um, or it could be linked up to send that info uh, directly to um, like a trusted advisors platform. Uh, the next one I like, uh, Beck's Farm Server. Um, it is a pretty easy to use platform. It's very user friendly. Um, if this is something new to you, um, if you are a Beck Seed customer, this platform is free to you. Um, it also allows you to view weather data uh, for each field, as well as view soil types. Um, it has a basic version and a pro version. Uh, the basic version being free to anyone, the pro version being free to Beck Seed customers. Um, next platform I like is Granular Insights, uh, free to anyone as well. Uh, this platform, like the other two on this list, um, is web-based and can be accessed anywhere you already have uh, internet connection. Uh, it's a really good place to import and view your data. Um, it is extremely user-friendly. Uh, this program doesn't allow necessarily for um, certain applications of data, uh, but it's very good if you're interested in just getting started with um, with this yield data portion. Um, this would be my go-to if I were just getting started with data management or was interested in something like field scouting. Uh, the next platform, Climate Field View, which we saw someone on here is already using it, which is great. 
um, in my experience, is one of the most used platforms when it comes to farmers. Um, it allows you to play with your data um, a pretty good amount, um, is very good at yield data visualization and storage, um, and it offers a couple different tiers of subscriptions that can unlock more detailed applications um, if you start to become more involved in, in your data management. Um, and the last one I'll just go through real quick um, is Echelon. Um, if you're a Nutrient customer, this platform does come free to use well. Um, and if your trusted advisor happens to be for Nutrient, you can link up your data to go directly to that platform where you both, you and your advisor, can view and edit it. Um, this is a really good platform for collaboration uh, between the advisor and the customer. Um, and it can really act as a hub to store most of your data um, and fertilizer and planning recommendations. So like mentioned before, there are a lot of different programs out there um, that are also really, really good. Uh, but for just getting started, um, I feel like any of these five would be beneficial to just jump in and start using. So now let's say you have your platform picked out and your field boundaries created. Now what do you do? So first step is to get that information off the zip drive and into the program. Um, from my experience, I've seen a lot of data get placed on zip drives um, and stuck in the desk drawer just to live for years. Um, Next, if you can be set up to do it, uh, link your preferred platform to the software that automatically gathers data from the field. So like I mentioned before, JD operations. Uh, this will make data management easier um, and a little bit more um, seamless if you use a different platform. Um, next two things to note um, is old data is still relevant and organization is key. Um, even if data on zip drives is a few years old, it doesn't mean it can't be beneficial or used, excuse me, to make uh, firm decisions. Also make sure everything on your platform is organized and named correctly. Um, this makes doing the work um, behind the keyboard a lot more enjoyable and a lot less frustrating. Um, so on this slide, I'll discuss what we can do to start to build the bigger picture for the farm. So we have a platform picked out, data entered in, and it's nice and organized. Now you can start to utilize it and make some of these on-farm decisions. So see if the program has features um, such as financial data entry. Uh, this can help you log and track um, seed, chemical, fertilizer, land costs, except any other type of costs, which will help you calculate um, this return on investment. Um, next, know the capabilities. Um, of your system and what you can do on your own with this platform and what you need outside help with doing. Um, for most people, this is where um, these variable rate prescriptions come into play. Um, also, can you view different field details such as soil type and uh, topographic maps? Uh, last, can you import some of the soil sample data and do different things with yield data? Um, a lot of the time, free programs won't allow you to do um, either one of those things and an upgraded subscription may be necessary if that's something that you're interested in. Um, utilizing data in the ways you see in that, in that last bullet point uh, tend to be slightly more complicated than just importing and viewing, um, but it will start to build a much more detailed view of the field where we can start to apply different layers um, to make more accurate um, on-farm decisions. Uh, which in turn will start to impact that bottom line, uh, which I'll start to cover here in these upcoming slides. So now we can start to jump in really into the meat of the presentation. Um, now that we have built a solid base of information and know the capabilities of our platform, we can start to really utilize this data. So um, let me see here. So these examples right here, I ran using, I'd mentioned it, that granular insights platform and the, there, there'll be other um, visuals here that I ran using SST Summit. So these first two visuals showing a soil type map along with a yield map. So these two maps may seem uh, relatively unrelated um, at first glance, but soil type can play uh, a pretty large role in your return on investment or try to calculate it. Um, as an example, um, so using this granular insights platform, it does give you the option to view yield by soil type. Um, in a more charted format, which is not shown here, but in that format, it shows that this Brookston silty clay loam, uh, which is the soil type in the orange, 
tends to produce on average the highest yielding crop on the farm versus um, other soil types. So a soil type map can also open you up to um, a different management practice such as zone sampling according to the soil type. Um, if your program or your advisor's program has um, those soil sampling capabilities. So the next map shown right here on the right hand side is a profit map. Uh, and this can be ran after entering in some of that financial data that I'd mentioned, such as input land costs. Um, the profit map was generated using um, automated input and land costs that the, uh, that the program just automated. So return on investment when you're looking at this field isn't necessarily accurate, but this still shows a really good representation of viewing profitability across the acre. Um, this profitability map could be extremely beneficial when discussing and viewing uh, profitability by farming practice. So as an example, if you were to split the field, uh, half being in cover crop and no-till and the other half being conventional till no cover crop, you could add in financial data for both splits and view profitability uh, when yield data does eventually come back in. So the only issue with these profitability maps, um, they do not show a good representation of um, certain co-benefits of farming practices, such as um, measuring soil health, uh, water quality benefits, or um, how much nutrients cover crops mined from soil, or how much soil is retained from erosion versus a conventionally tilled field. So this picture, which shows an example of co-benefit, um, shows nutrient sequestration of cereal rye at different stages of growth. Um, so within this ROI discussion, um, it could be beneficial with, with current fertilizer prices, how they are now, to try to sequester some of those nutrients out there in the field to be recycled uh, using cover crops for upcoming crop use. So this next map shows an organic matter surface analysis, which is based off of a two and a half acre grid soil sample. Um, being able to view certain surface analysis such as, uh, such as this one can also be beneficial in trying to anticipate productivity on your acre, um, as well as making a different management practice. So um, as an example for this farm, and probably many like it, the high organic matter areas tend to yield higher than the low organic matter areas. That's, that's, no, that's no surprise. Um, so how do we use an organic matter surface analysis like this to make a practical um, on-farm decision? Um, so back in 2018, I worked with a farmer who was involved in uh, Ohio State's E-Fields reports. Uh, he ended up variable rate seeding soybeans um, according to organic matter in four replicated plots um, with other check strips being planting rates of uh, 80,000, 120,000, 160,000, 200,000, and uh, all the way up to 240,000 soybean seeds per acre. So if you can see from that trial on the right hand side, it's a little small there, but the variable rated soybeans, according just to organic matter, average three bushel higher per acre. Um, and that is just from utilizing an organic matter surface analysis. Um, the next two maps uh, right here were generated um, for a variable rate broadcast application of 11520. Um, many of us have seen, you know, these variable rate application maps before, uh, but I think it's also important to see the surface analysis that goes along with the application map, and it shows, you know, the levels of the nutrients in the field. Um, I think it gives a good representation of where the levels in the field are and also makes more sense of these application maps for, um, for, heck, for the grower or even the retailer for visualization. Uh, the next two maps are similar to the uh, phosphorus application maps, but um, it's a potassium surface and a potash application map instead. Um, again, I think viewing the surface analysis next to the application map can help those who view it, especially the client of the nutrient service provider, just make more sense of it and it just kind of builds some trust. Uh, last two maps follow suit, um, but just showing soil pH surface analysis next to a, uh, a lime application map. Okay, so we're gonna jump into yield data here as we start to get towards the back half of this presentation. Um, so what can we learn from looking at a field uh, year to year? Um, a couple of ways are we can accurately calculate removal when we apply this data to variable rate fertilizer applications. So 
and a lot of precision ag platforms, it is fairly simple to utilize yield data in this way to more accurately cover removal of the past year's crop. Um, when you're trying to generate recs like this, um, once you apply that yield data, so there's um, certain parameters you need to enter in when generating dry fertilizer um, application. Um, one of those being um, yield removal. Sometimes it's you know 65 bushel soybeans or 180 bushel corn, but when you apply yield data to it, it gives you a much more accurate um, rec as well as lets you um, utilize those nutrients uh, better. Um, second, we can start to build a bigger picture after gathering yield data year after year. So it may seem like using yield data from four or five years ago may be kind of redundant, uh, but when you combine that data and stack it on with following years, it does start to create a more and more accurate picture of the field um, and its tendencies. Uh, so looking at yearly yield data, we can also see mistakes we made or potential areas of the field that may need our attention in the future. Um, so mistakes made being like a spray or skip, um, an area of low nitrogen due to maybe a mistake at side dress, uh, wet holes, any other variable can potentially be seen and accounted for. Um, it also allows us to see other areas of the field that may need attention or managed differently the following year. Um, so let's kind of jump into this multi-year data. I kind of touched on it in the slide before, but um, we discussed year-to-year -year yield data evaluation, but what about the bigger picture after stacking multiple years of yield data? So adding more than one year of data to the field can help show different areas of the field that may need attention, which may not have appeared when just looking at a single year of yield data. Um, so applying information to a field using multiple years not only can show other areas that may need attention, but can also potentially alleviate concerns of what maybe looking at one year of yield data could show. So as an example, looking at the yield data on the right hand side versus the multi year data on the left, the multi year data shows a more pronounced split in the field east of the ditch. Um, knowing more accurately where this field tends to change in productivity could help aid in a management program, uh, maybe through fertility or uh, even variable rate seeding if the grower set up to do so. Um, also, as an example of alleviating concern, um, the single year yield map on the right hand side shows an area of the field that seems to be a little less productive than normal. Um, Looking at the multi-year analysis on the left shows that this area of the field really tends to be one of the most productive areas. Uh, granted, so what you're looking at, the multi-year data is only showing an average of two years of yield on soybeans, uh, but I think this still shows a good representation of how multiple years of data uh, can start to show different tendencies of the field and help you make more accurate on-farm decisions and trying to calculate um, productivity and ROI. So let's take a look at this field as another example. Uh, this is a normalized yield analysis ran on three years of corn data, uh, being from 2016, 2018, and 2020. So the colors on the map are showing productivity trends, uh, showing red as less than 75% productivity, um, the orange coloring being between 75 and 95% productivity. Uh, the yellow, which I'd consider really the average producing areas of this field on the map, are between 95 and 105 percent productivity, and anything in the green is above 105 percent. Um, so for this map, what we really want to look at are the red and the orange areas. So looking at this field, um, where are we least productive and are we managing those acres the same as the rest of the field? Uh, the two areas that may need the most attention um, are along the woods and uh, what kind of appears to be maybe a wet area on the east end of the field. Um, so looking at the spatial trends, we see that there are about four acres of this field that are below 75% productivity, so that's stuff in the red, uh, when the field is put to corn. So if this is, you know, let's say this is a thousand acre farm, if the rest of this thousand acre farm was to generally follow suit where nearly 5% of the fields are hovering around or under, you know, that 75% productivity, um, there could potentially be roughly 50 acres being uh, mismanaged or potentially over applied. So 50 acres on a thousand acre farm, it really doesn't seem like that much, but 
you know, as we start to put these financials to it, um, it could save a fair amount of money as well as, you know, improve nutrient utilization on those acres. Um, so less lost or wasted fertilizer. Um, as far as the money saved, so applying 25% less, so that's according to those red areas, that 75% productivity um, over those 50 acres that could save the grower about $12.75 per acre. And that's just in map cost. Um, or $640. Um, that map cost being generated from a figure back in October, it was uh, at the time, it was $750 per ton, um, 11520. So again, not accounting for any potash or any other fertility costs associated with reducing application rates in those red areas. Um, also, it should be noted, this is um, only accounting for areas that are 75% or red and under. If we were to apply these management practices to areas where production is consistently lower than the field average, um, like those orange areas, it could have even more of a positive uh, economical effect. Um, and all of that just from utilizing yield data. So let's kind of jump back in uh, to practical application of, you know, of return on investment. So we discussed single year yield data as well as normalized yield. Um, also, it should be, I should note quickly uh, that these spatial trends of multiple years of yield data can be calculated using um, multiple different crops. So for instance, you could run this trend map on the right hand side using two years of soybean yield data stacked onto three years of corn data um, on the same field. Um, I generally don't like to do that. Uh, because when I look at a trend map like this, I want there to be as few variables as possible. Um, and in general, soybeans and corn act differently when viewing their trend maps, respectively, um, kind of as you can see here. Um, so what about other types of analysis uh, to run on just according to yield? Um, so this yield map right here has a buffer analysis ran on it, uh, which shows yield trends of corn in 40 foot strips along, uh, along these buffer areas. So along the woods buffer up there on the top. Uh, different analysis such as this one can be utilized to view um, and determine profitability in different portions of the field. But in this case, we can see that um, on average between that zero and 80 foot mark from the woodlot, we tend to yield well below average, which in this case is roughly 75% um, productivity. So we can use analysis like this uh, to potentially alter a management practice, uh, maybe such as a fertility application in this case, um, to help positively impact our bottom line. Um, it should also be noted every field is different, um, and it can be really economically and environmentally beneficial um, to manage each field accordingly. Um, so let's go over some key takeaways um, from what we covered on data and ROI. We got a couple minutes here, um, and then we can open it up uh, for some questions if there are any. Um, first, in the wake of high input prices, it could be beneficial to look at that marginal acre. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to impact the bottom line rather than cutting a cost that may not be agronomically beneficial. Uh, next, the precision ag space is growing exponentially. Um, it can be a very good service to offer customers as a retailer. Uh, to help build trust and retain other clients. Um, and it can be an excellent tool for the farmer uh, to make more accurate decisions. Uh, next, consult with a trusted uh, agronomist or consultant uh, when it comes to this type of data utilization. Um, like I said before, it is a full-time job for some people for a reason, um, and they can help positively impact that bottom line as well as provide maybe some other potential insights. Um, and last, proper data utilization not only improves that bottom line, but it builds trust and value between the grower and their advisor. Um, it also is environmentally friendly, um, as these types of management practices can aid um, in better nutrient utilization, which improves um, these environmental outcomes. Um, it really can be a win for the advisor, a win for these environmental outcomes, and uh, importantly, um, a win for the farmer. So. Um, with that, uh, we can just open it up to some questions. I know we're kind of getting to the end of our time, but um, I'll stay on as long as uh, as I can with questions. So, you're welcome to put the questions in the chat or come off mute. And I've also put an evaluation form in the chat box. 
Yep, if you don't want to come off mute, chat is fine. I'll uh, I'll keep an eye on it here. Um, just give it a couple minutes, and uh, if no questions, great. We'll just uh, we can stop recording and do our thing. Um, my contact information is there, uh, brent.nickel at tnc.org. So if you do uh, have a question after we're done here and you didn't want to come off mute or you thought about it after, uh, feel free to email me um, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So. Uh, kind of mentioned at the beginning, um, this ROI piece is a very large discussion and I only I just jumped in on you know yield data utilization but um, there are a couple different angles that you could attack this ROI discussion from which um, we can have discussions on later on so Well, no questions. Thank you everyone for jumping on. It looks like we had a pretty good turnout. Um, it's much appreciated. And I hope uh, hope we all learned something from, from me talking. With that, Stephanie, and we can uh, shut her down here. And if anyone needs to go, feel free. I'll stay on for another minute or so just in case, but.